everything happened so fast. Definitely she called classification like, man, we got a juvenile down here, and he just been sentenced to life. So what they did was they grabbed me out the juvenile part and put me in confinement. And they were like, you can't come out of confinement because due to your sentence. And so it still hadn't registered in me that I got a life sentence because I'm like, man, I, just, I couldn't believe that. I'm like, no, nah, this can't be true. They was like, well, Mr. Young, you know, um, you're not going home no more. You're going to die in prison. I'm like, who going to die? I ain't dying in prison. So I was in denial of that because it happened so fast. It's just like one day I'm, I'm 15 years old and I'm in society. Then the next, I'm, I'm out and you telling me I ain't going to never go home? That's kind of like hard to deal with. And I couldn't grab the concept of that. Kenneth Young, he was 14 and 15 years old when he's charged with four life without parole sentences here in Florida. So that means for all purposes, theoretical and practical, Kenneth is condemned to die in Florida prisons. So we have been working on this case since 2006, 2007. He had exhausted all of his appeals. He exhausted all of his post-conviction motions. That was it. There was nothing more for Kenneth. Supreme Court comes up with this decision, Granby, you know, Granby, Florida, that says kids are different. They wanted to continue the motion just because we didn't. You have to give them a second chance. You have to give a second look. Let's see what this individual became as an adult. And let's then decide what a fair sentence is under our Constitution. in Florida courts for years, saying that that is violates the Constitution. And the Florida judges uniformly denied it. So it really took our United States Supreme Court to say enough of this, enough of this barbarism. Kenneth Young, he's here for a resentencing. I'm ready to hear from uh, both counsel. What I want to say is, kids are different, but Kenneth is, is exceptional in that difference. So in order for Kenneth to be released now. We are here today seeking a second chance for Kenneth Young. Kenneth was 14 years old at the time of the first offense. And all four offenses occurred within a 30-day time period. What the state must do is give defendants like Graham some meaningful opportunity to obtain release based on demonstrated maturity and rehabilitation. 
We're going to show today that Kenneth Young has demonstrated maturity and rehabilitation. And that is what the heart of this resentencing is all about. It was on a Saturday, and I received a call about the, an attempted armed robbery. I went to the Comfort Inn and uh, started taking statements. I heard the door open. So I saw a gentleman coming in, and I saw another gentleman behind him. I knew it by their entrance that this is not going to turn out to be good. He was going into the hallway. Where's the restroom? And I said, oh, the restroom is on down that way. And in the meantime, one of my coworkers, Rosa, was walking to the same area. And uh, they both ran into each other. And I, when, when I heard the Rosa screaming, I came, I tried to came on the back area to see what's going on, why, what happened to her. And at that point, uh, that person was holding her and pointing a uh, gun on me. Somehow Rosa managed to run and try to go get some help. One had the gun and the other one was trying to grab me and I was trying to push them away, I guess. But uh, when they realized that, that uh, the, 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 that other person may get some help or, you know, it's kind of not as, uh, as easy as they had thought so, they ran away. Young and Bethea, they were spotted by Deputy Sims. They took a left onto a dirt road, and as they came to the dead end of the dirt road, he had to make the stop. Deputy Sims exited his car with his shotgun ready to take action if needed. And once backup arrived, they were both handcuffed and secured. I conducted an inventory on the vehicle, a green in color Chrysler Sebring. I recovered the following items as evidence, a 38 Colt special revolver with six unfired Winchester bullets still in the gun, $472, some necklaces, and also recovered from the uh, vehicle is a, was a uh, VCR recorder. I could see that there was a, a, a VHS tape still inside. The first person that entered was uh, uh, Jaquez Bethea, and the second person, the taller, thin one, was uh, Kenneth Young. I was very concerned. I didn't know what had happened. I didn't know if the uh, something happened to the clerk. It may have been a homicide. And uh, I needed to find where this occurred at. We had a series of robberies in the Tampa Bay region. was very violent, over the counter, very vocal, in your face, guns to the head, putting people down on the ground. Our victims told us in, in all of these robberies that the most vocal one was, was Bethea. He was the older of the two. He was the one with the firearm. I'm not sure if Kenneth Young knew the consequences, quite frankly, at the time. But I, I, at that age, they really don't. Yes, ma'am. All right, sir. Good afternoon. Please give us your name, sir. Good afternoon. Kenneth Young. First and foremost, Your Honor, I want to take the time out and say I take full responsibility for my actions and my role in these crimes. I have lived with regret every day as a civilized human being for these crimes. I have been incarcerated for 11 years, and I have taken advantage of every opportunity available for me in prison to better myself. I have been a model prisoner while being incarcerated. 
I have been in educational programs. I have taken care of elderly inmates. I have worked with mental inmates. Also, I have learned that the condition of your mind creates the condition of your ways. So I strive every day for good standards. I am no longer the same person I used to be. I have people who believe in me and most of all, family who supports me. First Corinthians chapter 33, verse 11 say, when I was a child, I thought I was a child, but when I became a man, I put away all childish things. I want to turn around and apologize to my victim for what I did. I take full responsibility and I apologize for that. Thank you, Young. Look, Kenneth Young, he was with Jock Bathia, a 24-year-old. They go to separate trials. Kenneth receives four consecutive, one after another, life sentences. Whereas Bathia, he received one concurrent life sentence. So he received a less of a, of a penalty than Kenneth. And we find that around the country, that these juveniles many times are being punished um, much harsher than adults. It's heartbreaking to me the way we've gotten comfortable uh, demonizing children, mostly kids of color. Uh, we don't feel in any way socially constrained or morally constrained. Talk to the cameras. Uh, Brian Stevenson, uh, director of the Equal Justice Initiative. And um, uh, we don't think there's any dispute that to say to any child of 13 uh, that you're only fit to die in prison is cruel. And we believe that the Constitution prohibits that kind of punishment and that this court should enforce that in this case. About the argument that... You know, my work with young people in prison and adult prison really began at representing people on death row. Uh, the United States uh, permitted the death penalty for juveniles until 2005. Uh, when we finally persuaded the Supreme Court to ban the death penalty for, for, for children, I was uh, clear that that would not be, uh, life imprisonment without parole would still not be a just outcome for many of these kids. And even after these Supreme Court decisions, we're finding lower trial court judges and in some state courts that are very hostile uh, to these children. We had these people saying, oh, these kids aren't really kids. They're super predators. These kids aren't really uh, like other children. They're criminals. And so we have to keep pushing that, fighting that. And please be telling me, sir, from the testimony, you look at the bigotry, the whole truth, nothing but she's talking about. Yes, I do. Now, based on your evaluations, what is the psychological significance that Kenneth was only 14 and 15 years old at the time of the offenses? Juveniles are different, one, in terms of their um, susceptibility to persuasion and their ability to be led by others. Uh, second way they're different. Adolescents take less of a concern and are less able to understand others' perspectives. They're more self-focused. And many people who have adolescents kind of realize that <laughs> during their teenage years. What is the significance of Kenneth's young sister and mother and aunt maintaining regular contact with Kenneth while in prison. One of the risk factors for reoffending is this kind of emotional detachment. You can't sympathize or empathize with people, so who and cares? Why not find any emotional them? detachment with Kenneth no, Young? I, I didn't find that. Coming out. What are you thinking? Do I see Kenneth coming out? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Judge has total discretion. Total discretion. Okay. So he's not forced by the law to give a 16 year sentence or a 40 year sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't see him doing 40 years at all. Mm -mm. And, and and I know the judge has a heart. I've prayed and I ask for forgiveness on behalf of me and my son. It doesn't matter what they ask me, I'm ready. Well, they may ask you, what's the last time you took drugs? And I would tell them the truth, two years ago. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I had one relapse. Yep. And you purchased uh, drugs from uh, Jacques Pathia? 
Once upon a time, I sure did. I stayed in like a low income area. That's the vibe that I was brought up in, low income. You know, so drug dealings and, you know, robberies occur. You have all type of stuff, just low income area. Everybody trying to like do what they do. Sometimes mama locked me and my sister in the room and she just be gone. I'd be on my bicycle and I already know like nine times out of ten where she would be at. Getting high because in my neighborhood you have like certain apartments, certain houses that people go to to get high. And I get on my bicycle and I try to pull her from around there, tell her come home, take a shower, eat, stuff like that, you know. Lately, I've been doing pretty good and keeping myself clean. I'm staying more focused now, and my son taught me that. He says, Mom, you need to learn how to stay focused. I didn't know, I didn't know how to stay focused, but Kenneth taught me doing while in prison. Yeah, my mom, she come see me. We got a good relationship. She come see me. She been doing good. She been staying off drugs and alcohol. Got her own apartment now. Car. You know, she come see me, we talk, talk about the Bible, talk about life, period. You know, a lot of times she come see me, she talk about she wish she could have been a better mom and did this and did that, you know. She regret a lot of stuff that she did. You know what I'm saying? As far as not like being there for me, like she feels she should have been as a parent. You know, I forgave her for it, though. I believe that every person are more than their worst act. Somebody tells a lie, they're not just a liar. If they take something that doesn't belong to them, they're not just a thief. Even if you kill somebody, you're not just a killer. Uh, we don't punish crimes, we punish people. And so what's a just punishment? Is it just to take a 13-year-old child and put them in prison and condemn them to die there? And that's the kind of conversation that's hard to get at in a country that has been corrupted, in my judgment, by the politics of fear and anger, where everybody wants to be tough on crime and everybody is afraid to be seen as sympathetic, compassionate, merciful uh, to people who have committed violent acts. The state's trying to retry the, tr the case. We don't want to retry the case. They're going to have how many witnesses? Two police officers and two victims. So that's four plus a letter they're going to read. So, and, and all that's all going to be uh, Kenneth willingly participated in these crimes. Call Sandra Christopher. Raise your hand, please. You solemnly swear from the testimony you will give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth outside. I do. All right, ma'am, you have a seat. Please watch your step. Now, ma'am, I want to ask you some of the basic facts. Um, I'm going to take you back to the date of June 20th of 2000. Can you tell me? Your Honor. Yes. A relevant thing. No the issue in this case is the Graham Free Florida, every Florida issue of whether or not there's been demonstration of rehabilitation and maturity. Yeah, this is not a case where we're retrying three separate trials here today. Sir, I'm going to have to disagree with you. That is not the standard. The Supreme Court of the United States did not instruct the trial courts on resentencing for that to be a standard. That it's is a simply, principle, Your Honor. It's a principle, sir, yes, but sir. it's not a guideline for sentencing. I am going to focus on the facts of this offense. Overruled. Go ahead. Thank you. I 
Miss Christopher, that's a picture of the gun that was pointed at your head. Looks like a similar one, yes. <clears throat> How long was Excuse the me. gun held to your head? It didn't seem like it was that long, but it was long enough. Now, are the uh, assailants saying anything to you? Oh yeah, they are wanting to know where the safe is, where's the money. Um, you need to tell us, otherwise, you know, some explicatives, you know, um, your your butt, the whole thing. Um, tell us what they said, man. Really? I want to hear it word for word. Well, we, they wanted to know where the damn money was. Um, if we didn't tell them, they were going to shoot our ass. Um, they were, you know, kicking us. One of them actually put the gun on my head. I had a bruise for days. I had photos of it I can't find. Ma'am, what are you thinking at the point that you have this gun to your head? God and I are good. Well, I went through a checklist that fast. God and I are good. So, you know, when they say your life flashes before your eyes, it does. As much as I know that he wants to be released, I'm not ready to have him walking around where I live. And I'm not moving. Good afternoon. Hi, Ms. Christopher. Um, now, as I understand, you didn't testify at the first hearing, but Ms. Andreski did? I believe so. Earlier you stated that both of the both people had had a gun. Would it surprise you to know that she testified only one person had a gun? I'm just trying to rethink real quick them coming through the door. If you just give me just a moment. Sure. Um, And actually, no, that wouldn't surprise me. Because okay. there, there was one person that came in in the front with the gun, and then the other person was behind him. I understand um, that, you, that you suffered a, a bruise after this, after this incident. Indeed. Um, did you have to go to the hospital afterwards? No. OK. Um, just one last quest question, Ms. Christopher. Are you the same person that you were at age 14? Judge, you going to eject the relevance? Sustain. And nothing further, Your Honor. Kenneth was always lumped into the same type of person that, that Bethia was, um, that he played just as much of a role, that he was just as much of a leader, that he it was just as much his idea as it was Bethia's. And I just don't think that was the case, you know? I mean, you have a 24-year-old, um, hanging out with a, with a 14 year old and you know he owned the gun he owned the car um, he had an extensive criminal history before this and so I want to make sure it's very clear that their roles were different I moved to Florida because my sister lives in, at the time she was living in Clearwater. So I just went down there to initially just spend some time, a couple weeks, and then it, it turned into a couple years. So it was the year, it would have been 2000 when all this shenanigans happened. Initially, when they when they came, it was maybe at the latest 5:30. Like it was it was early in the evening. It was still daylight. They came in, and Kenneth was on this side of me, so my left hand side, and then Bethea with gun basically came over the counter at me, right? And then um, <clears throat> my hair was in a ponytail, so. Sorry. He grabbed me by the back of my hair and stuck the gun to my head. He he was saying like give me the money, right? With the gun to my head. So of course I opened the register. I don't know what got it in this man's head, where his mind turned from money to other things. But he, he started to say, to say like, I'm gonna rape this bitch. 
you know, he just kept saying that over and over, you know, and then Kenneth was not in the room. He was still in the lobby. Like, he wasn't even behind the front desk. So Bethea kept saying that, and he came to the doorway, and he said, you can't do that. We have to leave. Bethea basically picked me up off the ground by my hair, and then he threw me on the floor and kicked me in my back, and then they left. All right. This is Ken. He always been a little clown. And this is Ken here as a baby. Now this is Ken, one of my favorites picture. They danced the night away him and Kat at my father's birthday party. Cause he lo he could dance, he can dance. And I guess he get that from me. I thank God today for not killing myself. Because I want to give up, I did. And it hurts me so bad because I fought myself for everything. I did, because I felt like if I didn't have the substance abuse in my life, my son wouldn't be where he at today. Now you were forced to commit these armed robberies back in 2000 because Jack Bethea had threatened your mother's life for your mother supposedly stealing some dope from Bethea. Absolutely, ma'am. You spoke to law enforcement back in the year 2000 after you were arrested, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you also spoke to members with the Department of Juvenile Justice before you were sentenced after your first trial, correct? Yes, ma'am. When you were being interviewed by the Department of Juvenile Justice, they were trying to find out what you'd been through, what happened, so they could make some type of sentencing recommendation to the court, correct? I don't know what the what the job was. All I know, they came to interview me. I was young then when they came to see me. So this is the first time you are saying that you could have ever told anybody about the fact that your mother was being threatened by the older co-defendant, and that's why you had to commit these armed robberies. No, I told that to my public defender. And when I came back in Hillsborough County about the story of what happened, her name was April Hughes. April Hughes told me she do not want to hear that. She was concerned about the charges, what's in front of her. That's what she told me. She never brought it up in court. I never testified in court. I never testified through my trials. I know I always remained silent. Do you take any responsibility? Sir, for the commission of these crimes and the effect it's had on the victims? Yes, ma'am, most definitely. But would you describe yourself as um, an active participant in these crimes or somebody that took a backseat role? I take full responsibility for my role in these crimes. And I live remorse and regret for my, what I did to the victims. But it's your testimony that the only reason that you ever committed these crimes is because you were threatened and your family's life was threatened by the co-defendant, Bethea. Exactly. Judge, I don't have any other questions at this time. All right, so Counselor, do you have any questions? No questions, Your Honor. All right, thank you, sir. You can thank you, sir, Your Honor. public defender and I met Mr. Young, my first impression, because I didn't originally have the case. So by the time I first met Mr. Young, he had already been to, to trial in Tampa. I can tell you that my conversation with the state attorney's office, from their perspective, if we had gotten the case first, um, they were going to use, if possible, Kenneth uh, against this other gentleman, because they thought that 
due to the age disparity, that maybe this guy did have a lot of influence over Kenneth's actions. But unfortunately, we did not get Kenneth first. The, the, the other counties got him first. And so the damage was already done as it relates to the sentencing. I have been on the bench since January 3rd of 2011. I do believe juvenile court is social work because I do believe it does take a village. And I do believe that you have to think outside of the box. And so you have to cure sometimes the problem. Sometimes it's because there are academic issues. Sometimes because there's poverty in the household, we're doing it just because we need to put food on the table. Mr. Perry. Right here, Mr. Perry. Come over here so I can see you. Right there. How are you doing this morning, Mr. Perry? How are you doing this morning? Grandma, thank you for bringing him in. And it is difficult to give a child hope when they don't see any hope around them, when they live every day in poverty or they live, they, their parents are in jail, their, their neighbors are in jail. But what I try to get them to see is look at me. There's nothing special about me. I'm living my dream. I grew up on the south side of town. I know my grandparents took care of me. My parents were young um, when they had me. And so what I try to get them to do is to remember, we don't get to choose our family members, but we can choose the actions that we take. The cycle can be broken. Why not starting the, breaking the cycle with you? If you are sympathetic to the people who are victims of crime, uh, as I am, uh, then there's no population uh, more deserving uh, of our help uh, than the kids who have been sentenced to die in prison for crimes they've committed. Uh, if I look at that population, they'll be some of the most victimized people in our society. Uh, these are the kids who've suffered uh, physical abuse and sexual abuse and neglect and torture and mistreatment and poverty and malnourishment and all kinds of mental health problems with no help and medical problems with no help. And no one's done anything. Uh, that's the population that we're talking about. And if we respond to them in that way, then I think we come up with very different solutions than life imprisonment without parole. Why is it significant that Mr. Young has only one disciplinary report in his time in prison? I had a hard time believing it. Uh, at the time uh, Mr. Young went into the prison uh, system, he was what's referred to by both uh, staff on the compound and other inmates as a jitterbug. They come into the prison system and uh, they feel intimidated by the older inmates and they feel they have to uh, uh, prove themselves at every turn. I think the first thing I asked him was, how did you make it 11 years? Absolutely no discipline. And uh, he said that uh, by just continually asking uh, for programs and chances. Nobody's handed him a thing. Because of the length of his sentence, they, uh, they won't give him a GED program. They won't give him any education because they feel it's a waste. Why should you waste this educational effort on someone who's going to be in prison the rest of their life? Uh, so he did it on his own. We'll take a five minute break. We'll uh, start back at 3.15, please. We were the leader in lynchings uh, in the United States per population in Florida. So in the juvenile system, when we see that it's not a coincidence or an accident that the vast majority of these kids who received life without parole sentences were African-American kids.
dropped out of school because my sister, she was 15, and she had had her first child. And, you know, she was trying to work and stuff like that, so I'd stay home and take care of my little niece till she come home from work and things like that. So, you know, it was just basically like me and my sister. I'm 11, she 15, got a kid. Our mama ain't there, you know, so. I was a child, but now that I'm adult, I really, like, look back on a lot of stuff and was like, hey, man, I should have stayed in school. Me and my sister could have came up with something better. Now that I'm older, this time I'm thinking. But at the time, I'm, I'm 11 years old. My sister four years older than me. She 15. She got a baby. I did write to Kenneth um, probably two or three years after the incident. By that point, I would have known how young he was at the time and, and learned a little bit about um, how his life had been. And um, I wanted him to know who I was. Like, I sent photos of myself as well. I wanted him to know what he did to my life. You know, what that incident, what him and Bethea did that day, how it affected my life. And um, I also wanted to tell him that I forgave him for what he'd done and that to thank him for whatever his reasons were for making them leave, that I was grateful for that that he prevented it from being worse than it already was. You tell me, for the testimony, we'll give the, we'll give the truth, the whole truth, nothing but truth out of that. I do. Approximately how long do you recall your interview with Mr. Young lasting when you met with him? Uh, it was a fairly extensive interview uh, going through the process. I'd say at least an hour. He said he was approached by Mr. Uh, Bethea, uh, because he needed to make money. His mom was a single mom. He needed to provide her with some money when he could, so he agreed to do that. Did Mr. Young say what his role was in that robbery? Oh, his role was, uh, again, as he stated earlier, that he just went in to see if there was a check for cameras, as he put it, to see if there's any surveillance equipment in there. And uh, Mr. Young also stated to you that he was afraid of John Bethea. He did. And that Mr. Bethea had threatened him at one point. Yes. And one of the robberies, Bethea threatened Kenneth Young. He told him that he would shoot him or kill him if he doesn't get, and really get in a hurry to get this money. When you see a, a young man like a Kenneth Young who has problems, I mean, these are a lot of things that we see. The Pinellas County Sheriff's Office receives about 10,000 reports of neglect and abandonment and abuse of children on an annual basis. If there's something that we can do with respect to taking another direction, um, I think we should do that as a society, quite frankly. I'm not sure that 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds need to be in prison the rest of their lives. Call your next witness, please. Your Honor, would like to call Stephanie Young? I think she speaks from the heart. That's good because honesty and authenticity is really what's going to count here. But when she talks about being an excellent mother, and that might not resonate with the judge, given the fact that she was a crack addict. I mean, I think she tried to be an excellent mother. Raise your name, please. Yes. Please only swear from testimony. We'll give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about that. Yes, ma'am, I do. Ma'am, you can have a seat right here, please, and watch your step. Ms. Young, would you please state, just for the record, when was the first time that you used drugs? 1987. And how long were you addicted to drugs? Maybe over 19 years. Uh, what sort of role did your parents play in, um, in raising Kenneth? They talked with Kenneth. He, Kenneth knows the Ten Commandments. 
Did they ever step in if you were having problems keeping your apartment or? Well, yes, they did. They came and got Kenneth at Ebony. Okay. If I can read my letter to the judge and to apologize to the people that he done the robbery to, it would explain everything. If the judge would give me permission to read my letter. Yes, sir. When was it written, ma'am? This morning. Okay, go ahead. Uh -huh. Dear your, your Honor, I am very sorry that I was not more focused on my family because of my substance abuse. But your Honor, Judge Sleep, now me and my son are icing for your forgiveness. I pray from my heart that the people's peace, my son disturbed, will find it in their hearts to please, please forgive my son. I said, I say because if I knew what I know now, I would not never have been in the substance abuse. Please, Your Honor, help me put my family back together. Please forgive me. I know as a mother, my son will never come back through your system again. I know he won't come back through your system. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Ma'am, you talked about having some addiction problems, and I understand that. Um, however, you still knew the difference between right and wrong. Yes? Yes, I did. Now, ma'am, you spoke with Dr. Otto. You heard him testify earlier, correct? Yes, I did. And you'd also agree with me that you spoke to Dr. Otto about whether or not you had left Kenneth home for up to a week at a time by himself. Do you remember having that conversation with Dr. Otto? He was not by himself. He was with his sister or a family member. So that would be false if your son reported that to Dr. Otto. And ma'am, you actually went and met with different officers for the, his first case. You never told that Jock Bethea was your drug dealer and that your son was forced to commit these robberies. At the time, I didn't think that was none of his business. And now today, you do want them in your business? Yes, well, yes, yes I do. Judge, I have no further questions. Ma'am, we need to uh, make your letter a part of the record, please, since you read from it as part of the testimony. Yes, she didn't come all the way straight forth. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I knew it was more she wanted to say because when she come see me, she stayed way more and more deeper stuff than she said in that letter. My mom, she feel like she kind of shamed. She knows she played a part in me being incarcerated. There are some things I did forget, but I regret that I didn't, was, wasn't honest to let him know, yes, being on drugs and things, I have left Kenneth at the house by himself. But all I could thank God for, I'm glad my baby being like two and a half, that he didn't walk out in front of no car or anything and stuff like that, and um, and, and any judge know, children go through strenuous situation having a mom on drugs. Kenneth has seen a whole lot of things, you know? There's no point of keeping him in prison. What's the point? He's been rehabilitated. We can prove that. He's only had one infraction called disciplinary report in 11 and a half, you know, 11 point something years. And that was for not making his bed on a Saturday morning. And my daughter, Anna, I, I don't know if she's ever made her bed on a Saturday morning. Thank you, see.
Okay, I'll hear brief arguments from both sides, starting with the defense, please. What Mr. Young did is, is serious. People were held at gunpoint, their lives were put at risk. But, I mean, we are here today because the Supreme Court says that kids are different. You know, we heard a lot of facts of the crimes today. We stipulate to that. He was convicted, but it was 11 years ago. And since that moment on, he has worked extremely hard to make himself a better person and realize that he needs to change. Judge, I will let you know that the state of Florida is seeking 40 years Florida State Prison to be followed by 10 years of probation. He's now age 26 and he would be around 50 years old when he would be released, according to my rough calculations. Um, that obviously would comport with Graham. Uh, the most recent full life expectancy table indicates that a black male who is currently 26 years old would have an average of 46 years of life remaining. Uh, that means that 72 years old is the average age of a death for black males who are currently age 26. Based on that judge, we'd ask for the 40 years followed by 10 years. Your certificates and diplomas that you provided to me in your sentencing, Miranda, I appreciate that and congratulations to you. But you know what that demonstrates to this court? It demonstrates that the Department of Corrections and your particular incarceration was appropriate and effective. Usually, when I'm sentencing a young man like you, I'll hear it either from you or from family members. Please don't throw this young man's life away by sending him to a prison where he's going to rot. If I had a dollar for every time I heard that, I'd be a rich man. Now, if I follow your attorney's request to release you today, I might as well just give you the key to the city, a parade, and dinner at Burns. That would be an award, a gift that you will not get from this court. You will not get it, sir, because you do not deserve it. I heard your statement. I believe that you have some remorse. I believe that you've been rehabilitated. But I'm listening to these victims, sir, and I do not believe that this court should rely on your prison conduct thus far. Sir, this is about personal responsibility and accountability. You have no legal basis to play the blame game on anybody else, sir. There's no legal basis for you to blame Mr. Bethea for your conduct in this case, sir. So, on 00CF14744, sir, you're adjudicated guilty, 30 years Florida State Prison. Concurrent with 00CF1112, adjudicated guilty, 30 years Florida State Prison. Concurrent, <coughs> concurrent with 00CF15877. You're adjudicated guilty on counts one and two, 30 years Florida State Prison with 10-year minimum mandatory on both. The 10-year minimum runs concurrent. All of these sentences run concurrent. I thought that he would probably see that. I had showed from the time I was 14 years old all the way till I'm 26 that I have matured and everything. I thought that that would mean something to him, but he just basically told me that don't mean nothing. And I was every, like, every um, institution I went to, they were like the hardest institutions in Florida. With all the violence, gang violence, stabbings, rapes, everything. that's the worst of the worst, everywhere I went. And I survived through all that, then he just like, oh, that don't mean nothing. I'm like, oh, you, re you showed that you had rehabilitated, but I'm still gonna send you to this. Come on, that's... At least he doesn't have life. And I'm gonna continue to go visit my son and continue to fight for his right. I am. I'm, I'm sorry, because I was hoping for that. Me too, me too. You can't be, let it get to you. You can't be down because you gotta always think, okay, I didn't have this. I was supposed to die here. This is what I was sentenced to. So when you got hope, now you say, whoa, boy, I might be, I got a little stretch down the line, but I got hope at the end. I see, I see some light. You know, now you got to take that, that light that you see and make that light brighter by continuing to fight with your case.
And I'm gonna fight for what I believe in. I believe I changed. I believe I showed remorse. I believe I matured. I know that I ain't the same 14, 15 year old no more. And that's what I believe, so I'm gonna continue to fight for that. So you know, it, 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 ain't, it ain't over. It don't never be over for you till you're in the casket. You know, I believe, I'm a firm believer in that. When you hit the casket, then it's over. But other than that, you got hope, you got to continue to fight. It's a process, I understand that, patience.